Welcome back, everyone. Um, this is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. We just came from executive session. It's about uh, six past uh, seven, and we'll go back to our uh, regular um, agenda. And I do want to start off by apologizing for being late for the start of the meeting. I get stuck in traffic. Um, everyone um, who um, obviously won't be watching this is driving. I hope they're careful because uh, 95 was absolutely horrible. So uh, thank you for letting me be tardy. Um, moving into uh, is it the first order? Number four. General. Number four, sorry. Um, general public comments. Uh, this is an opportunity if, if you would like to get up and speak to the council on any item that is not on tonight's agenda, you're welcome to come up to the podium and you have three minutes if you can state your name and address. Um, there is a little um, blinking system that goes up there with that, but you're welcome to approach the podium. Anybody would like to speak? Going once, going twice, we'll close the public session. Moving on to um, item number five, minutes from January 4th, 2017, not 2107. Um, is, there any, <laughs> is there a motion from the council? So Move approval. Second. Second. Any uh, comments, questions, or corrections for the town clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, six to zero. Um, there are no items, um, um, adjustments to the agenda that I know of, so we'll move on to item number seven, which is the treasurer's warrants. We'll sign those throughout the evening. And moving into the first um, order, order number 17-006. It's a seven o'clock uh, public hearing and action on the new request for a special amusement permit for Patrick O'Reilly doing business as O'Reilly's Cure located at 264 U.S. Route 1. Um, is there any comment from the public? The public hearing is op now open. Going once, going twice. We'll close the public hearing. And if there can be a motion from the council, please. So moved. Second. Um, any overview or comments from the clerk or the manager regarding, um, we're assuming that everything is in order yeah. and applicable. Mm -hmm. And everyone's aware what a special amusement license is. Go ahead. This question: Is there a duration on this? Is it for one year, or is it just per per unit or per it's event? It's annually. It's annually, annually, so it's for a full year. Okay, thank you. And automatically renewed by the clerk, and will not have to come back to the council. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, could could we get an explanation? What is it? What is it exactly? <laughs> Are you worried about special amusement? Is that? <laughs> 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 <I'm> curious. <yeah. laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. I now back in the day, there used to be. <laughs> I'll uh, I know what it is, but I'll turn it over to the clerk for a better explanation. It's an establishment that wants. Like I think in uh, for O'Reilly's Cure, they do in a trivia night well, where they sell alcohol. They have to have a special amusement permit. But it, it would allow live uh, entertainment, right. karaoke, uh, those a sorts band. of things as well. Yes, it's live entertainment. Mm -hmm. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> any any comments from council? Maybe. Not seeing any. All in favor? And that is unanimous, six to zero. <clears throat> Moving on to order number 17-007. It's a seven o'clock. Public hearing in action to add additional growth permits to the reserve pool in accordance with subsection 7.f.6 of chapter 413, the town of Scarborough's growth management ordinance. Uh, normally we open that for public hearing first, but what I would like to do is actually, because of the complexity of the topic, is actually maybe ask the manager to provide an overview for the public and then open it up to public hearing so that they can hear his comments, if you don't mind. If it pleases the council, I'd really like to defer to Dan Bacon, town planner. He's prepared a memorandum that I think is, is uh, best able <coughs> to introduce this to you. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dan Bacon, uh, planning director. Um, and as uh, Chairman Baybine indicated, it, it is a bit complex um, and has some history. So I wanted to just quickly provide a bit of background and then jump into what's before the council. Um, so in terms of in terms of background, more for the public's benefit, but also the council's, um, the town has had a growth management ordinance for about 16 years. Um, and essentially the growth management ordinance limits the amount of residential housing that can be constructed in any given year um, or on a yearly basis. And it really uh, came to enactment. It was created um, back in 2000, 2001, when the town was seeing a rapid single-family house construction in the late 90s, early 2000s. So single-family homes were the reason, um, and the pace of single-family home construction were the reason that the town established a growth management ordinance. Um, really given the pressures that type of construction was putting on the school facilities and their capacity. Um, 
that type of growth was inducing the need to add on to the schools and deal with kind of school, uh, school capacity issues. So this was a recommendation that actually came out of a growth and services report the town commissioned um, uh, thoughtfully back in the late 90s. And that was one key recommendation. And the other key recommendation that was implemented was establishing a school impact fee ordinance where um, new residential development had to pay a per unit fee that would go towards capital costs for the schools. And so that, that also has been in effect for about 15 or 16 years. And um, over that time has generated about $4 million in revenue for the community to, to help pay down debt and pay for school um, capital costs. And so both of those things, again, we're focused on single family construction because that is the, um, by a good measure, the largest contributor to school age population in terms of housing type. Um, since that time, the growth management ordinance, um, the, the pace of residential development has certainly changed and is moderated. I think the ordinance played a role in it, but certainly wasn't the only factor. Um, a serious recession played a role in slowing uh, residential housing starts, particularly single family housing, and demographics in, in the economy is changing in the last five to eight years how people want to live. You know, the housing choices they're making or housing types that they're they're pursuing. Um, so the growth management ordinance has been effective, um, but again, it's not the sole reason the town has um, better managed its uh, housing growth. And in terms of how the growth management ordinance was set up initially for the first eight years, it's been around 16 years, so the first eight years, it allowed for a maximum of 135 growth permits per year. And the way it was set up is if there were unused growth permits, um, they would roll over to the next year. So the next year would get whatever was left from the previous year. So that was the system, and there was one bucket of permits. That was the system for the first eight years. In 2008, after the comprehensive plan, after some work by the Long Range Planning Committee, and actually comprehensive plan implementation committee at the time, uh, the council updated the growth management ordinance to, to have two buckets of permits. The, the 135 is called the annual allocation. So that was intended to continue to, to regulate and moderate the amount of single family home construction and, and other construction that was typical at the time. Um, and then there was a reserve pool created, which is a second, second bucket of permits, which is, was viewed as um, extra permits, a reserve, but also permits for special projects, projects that were at the time intended to be incentivized, encouraged. Um, and those were to be contract zones where the council decided, yeah, that's a special project. We should allow it to get reserve pool permits and not have to worry about the annual allocation. Um, projects that include affordable housing um, were specifically spelled out like Habitat for Humanity or the Avesta project or others. Projects that were using the town's density bonuses, which we were trying to encourage uh, developers to use. Again, maybe for affordable housing or for land conservation. Um, and a final category is projects that were approved at the time that may be mixed use, meaning they were residential and commercial together. So the reserve pool was created in 2008 for those reasons, those specific eligible projects, not the, the typical projects that we see. And until now, the reserve pool hasn't been used because uh, the annual amount of permits was fine even to accommodate some of those special projects. We didn't need to dip into the reserve pool. So <clears throat> the other piece of it is the reserve pool was set up with initially with 215 permits, um, just as a starting point. And the way the ordinance is written is expected that as demand rises or use occurs of the reserve pool, staff and the council would keep track of that. And as there um, fewer permits were available in the pool, the council would, would do what you're doing this evening, consider adding to the pool um, to kind of meet the demand for the projects that qualify for the reserve. So that was specifically spelled out in there. And the reserve pool doesn't it doesn't um, expire each year. It's just a static number. It gets drawn down, and then it gets replenished. So that's 
a bit of background on sort of the complexity of the growth management ordinance in two different um, pools of permits and um, you know given and we had a workshop uh, in December kind of to introduce a lot of these things because there's a lot to, to consider in terms of understanding the growth management ordinance but also our impact fees and in our zoning um, but at this point in time and as was presented in December there's um, there's four or five or six you know that number of projects that are now either in the approval stage or in the development review stage or in the idea stage that qualify for the reserve pool and those projects are, are multifamily projects um, the vast majority of them are focused on one and two bedroom um, multifamily units and uh, they qualify for various reasons. Um, three out of the five are using affordable, the affordable housing bonus or including affordable housing, which I know is a goal of the council. One is in front of the council for consideration of the contract zone um, where the council asks for affordable housing to be considered. So that qualifies as a contract zone. And then there's a, a fifth project that's only in the idea stage that would also need a contract zone consideration by the council and I think they also are interested in the affordable housing um, kind of bonus provision. So all of those projects again qualify for the reserve and and that's why this is um, before you this evening. Based on our calculations um, just to provide a breakdown of the types of units 47% of these units are planned as one bedroom units, 48% are planned as two bedroom units, and 5% are planned as three bedroom units. Um, and I know there's been a lot of questions and discussion around kind of delivery of services effect on the schools, because that's why we have the growth management ordinance. And so based on our, our calculations and research in Scarborough on projects like these, um, and also in the state of Maine, one and two bedroom units really have very small impact on the schools. Um, a one bedroom unit um, generally doesn't have, have any school age kids in a one bedroom unit, so we're considering zero. Um, two bedroom units average um, about 0.1 school age child per two bedroom unit, so one in 10 Two bedroom units are forecasted to have uh, school age kids that may reside there and that's based on our research in Scarborough and a project in Westbrook and also looking at the state of Maine statistics. Um, three bedroom units are different. Three bedroom units are much more likely to have school age kids um, at a rate based on our calculations at about 0.4 um, per unit. And that's about half of a single family house. A single family house based on Scarborough <coughs> research is 0.8 school kids per single family house. Um, so I know that's a component of your kind of thoughts and considerations. So I want to provide those statistics. Um, and I also, and Tom has, I don't know if you want to share with the council, but we've calculated also the school impact fee kind of revenue that would go along with these projects because that's a, obviously a consideration because that's, we have the impact fees for a reason to help pay for a capital cost um, and based on what we're seeing, um, there's a very significant contribution to the school impact fee um, based on these projects and, and seems to provide more than ample sort of return on the, the likely forecast of any school age population contribution. Um, so really what's kind of before you is the recommendation to add to the reserve pool. Uh, we're recommending to add 285 growth permits to the reserve pool, really to meet the demand that is um, the potential demand that is forecasted by these projects. And as we typically do with land use and growth management topics, We've brought this to the Long Range Planning Committee um, and they've talked about it th on three different occasions in November, December, and January. And they've reviewed it. Um, 
and had a lot of discussion around um, around the growth management ordinance and they're they're recommending um, the council to the council to add the 285 growth permits and I provided in your packages sort of their key points that they they highlighted um, and I'll summarize them just quickly but I know that you've I'm sure you've read them and scrutinized them but one is that their view in talking working with staff and talking to the developers is that this interest in multifamily housing particularly one and two bedroom units is, is seemingly very much a blip in demand it's not necessarily the new trend for Scarborough where we're going to become a multifamily community um, there's some projects that have been planned for a number of years that just haven't occurred until now um, and there's some new projects that um, see a regional demand for this this type of unit and um, identified a few sites in Scarborough but there's only a certain amount of market demand in the region um, for at least in the, in the near term for this type of unit so this isn't likely to be the new trend for Scarborough in terms of housing so they were I would say comforted by by that notion these are all projects that are consistent with our zoning um, in our comprehensive plan so they're they're in line with uh, how the town's sort of zoned for this type of activity and felt that and they felt that we should uh, provide growth permits to to, to enable that um, the other kind of key piece to all this is that, that long range planning committee has been talking about is there's a lot of units being talked about at this point in time they're not all going to build out next month or the month after um, some are going to take years to build out they're going to be phased um, others are smaller projects that might be in the next year to 18 months and others as multifamily housing occurs in the region may not occur you know so this I would say that the list that you have in front of you and the list that you've seen from the workshop and sort of other other correspondence with the council that's kind of the if everything falls into place for each developer that's what is possible it's it's I think it's unlikely that they'll all occur and all occur in, in a rapid fashion um, I think the other thing that the Long Range Planning Committee has looked at is again sort of the school impact and, and the feeling that these aren't going to be big contributors to the schools based on our statistics um, but it would be a different conversation if they were larger units if they are three bedroom units um, I think there would be a very different kind of recommendation from staff and the Long Range Planning Committee in terms of these growth permits um, and I think lastly a kind of a key point to accommodating these projects is um, based on the values of the projects and the service demands these are um, pretty clearly um, assets fiscal asset assets to the community um, given our school impact fee given the light uh, amount of school age population and also these projects are very similar to commercial in terms of their they're fairly self-sufficient you know the public works isn't maintaining their sites or their roads trash collection is handled um, privately so they're not like typical residential construction where there's a fair amount of public works um, uh, demands and services that need to be provided so um, that's a lot of background and I wanted to be thorough but not too long-winded so I'm not sure if I threaded that needle but <laughs> I'm uh, certainly here to answer questions if you um, have any before or after the public yeah, so I'd like to actually have the public comments first and then sure. we can have some questions after if you don't mind could I just speak to this what we Absolutely. handed out mm -hmm. uh, two things just to perhaps compliment Dan's comments um, the 215 the uh, reserve pool that happened to be the number uh, that existed that rolled over in the sub in the prior seven or eight years um, I'm not aware that there's any magic to that number it just happened to be the number that existed at the time in 2008 just a point of reference and what we just handed out to you is a list of the projects Dan kind of characterized it as kind of the worst case scenario if everything happens um, you might note a number of projects we've talked about at the workshop or you're familiar about through the paper don't show up here and that's because either they didn't they don't qualify for reserve pool permits and so they're not part of this conversation they'll have to play the game to get the annual allocation when the time comes or they've actually already uh, received them a number of projects got in 
um, late in 2016, um, in late December, and took advantage of some of the existing allocation unused. And so their needs have been met and therefore they don't exist going forward. And this just attempts to uh, do an, uh, obviously a number of things, but uh, estimating the number of school aid children, um, estimates the impact fees to be paid, <coughs> and then it gets to the total number of birth permits that would, would be required if full build out actually occurred as many envision. Thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to do is now open it to um, public comments and the public hearing. Um, again, the rules are pretty, uh, fairly simple. Um, every person gets three minutes. There is a lighting system, green to red, uh, that will help guide you through that three minutes. If you can state your name and your address, um, and then you can speak. And if there, will be, if there are a few, please feel free to also stand in line. It, it usually goes pretty fast. Um, so open up the floor to comments. Anybody would like to speak? Uh, good evening, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Um, I got up here to speak in favor of it, in a yes vote tonight. Um, I was surprised when I first heard about this and you start throwing numbers around 500, 700, 800 permits. This is Maine and that sounds like, you know, just just totally out of, out of scale. But once you start hearing about it, I've been to the workshops, uh, the presentations that, that, that have been uh, uh, presented to you folks before and Mr. Bacon's uh, presentation tonight. Um, I feel that a lot of ground has been covered. Um, I think, you know, we have in this town the growth management or ordinance. Uh, we've got the long-term planning committee. Uh, that according to this, they've, they've uh, looked at this over three agendas. Seems like there's been a lot of work done. Um, we've talked about process or the lack of process and procedures, I think the town has put in place over the years things to protect us and to go through this methodically. And I feel that uh, it's been done. I think all the facts are, have been presented. And certainly um, the 135 permits a year is an automatic thing in our town. And so if the economy hadn't crashed, we would have been building housing, houses at that rate. And as, uh, as it says here, if we had just rolled those unused ones over, uh, we'd have 700, and we and nothing would have come to the council. And certainly, we all know that uh, when we build houses, that every one of those costs a lot of money. In that, you know, as far as the tax benefits, what they pay in taxes doesn't cover uh, the, the schools. So I'm in favor of this. I hope you vote yes. Uh, if you don't, um, I would like to at least maybe consider tabling it tonight and having a, uh, 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 another um, open session. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, good evening. Patrick Donahue, 15 Coldfart Farms Road. Um, I reached out to several of you regarding this uh, discussion. My question is, where is the demand coming from? It would be one question. The other question would be, what is the definition of affordable housing? I've asked four different people on the board, I've gotten four different replies, four different answers. The one answer that I got was from Councillor Rowan that said, he gave me the formula, which was fine. And then I said, is that based on the town, the state, the county? And he told me it's Greater Portland. I don't know where you get those figures from. That's not in the ordinance. It doesn't say Greater Portland in the ordinance. Not, not from what you sent me, it does not. Um, 850 units proposed coming to the town total in the long term, short term. Currently 770 units being built in Westbrook, Portland, South Portland. We would potentially have more than them combined. I've been real estate for 20 years. I'm a real estate appraiser, real estate broker. I'm in this business day in and day out. The only place the demand could be coming from is from the city of Portland because uh, landlords are now converting old units into newer units, jacking them up the rents, which will leave these people somewhere to go. In a lot of those cases, it's Section 8, which brings in to the misconception of affordable housing because people combine affordable housing with Section 8. They don't know the difference, which is a huge problem. I'm not opposed to Section 8. I grew up in Section 8 all my life. I know all about it. But when you bring Section 8 in, you better prepare for the services that uh, come with it, and it's... Un unsurmountable how much it will cost this town. 
not to mention there will be impact fees from the one bedroom units to the school or the two bedroom units from the school because we have people that are divorced one lives in one town one lives in another town they send their kid over here to go to school it happens it's really uh, it's reality so I would suggest you either table this or decline the uh, constant impact fees because if this keeps going on every year we can't agree on a school budget year to year with more impact it's just not going to happen thank you thank you next hi Suzanne Foley Ferguson 331 Black Point Road um, so I'm going to also ask that you guys uh, take another look maybe wait until the comprehensive plan um, comes forward or something I feel like it's too much too fast I will say that the the growth permits in the reserve pool it seems as though those really should be set aside for projects such as the one on the Eastern Road that's already approved or the one in the Dunstan area that's already approved the, the what's being presented to you tonight um, is really because of projects that have not actually been approved yet they're going to force if they come in and ask for those growth permits then they're going to cause problems for these other folks that already have approved projects so I get that this is a super complex issue but I, I was there when the growth management ordinance was uh, designed evaluated and it was intended to manage um, apartment building growth as well I know it's being played that it has not maybe not for this big maybe not for 300 units but if you look at section 7a2 this section talks about fractional growth permits for apartments so if we were not adopting a growth management ordinance that had to do with apartments as well why would we have included fractional growth permits um, so I just I want to sort of dispel that but one of the things I'm really concerned about is the impacts in the town and obviously the council is <clears throat> should be doing what the community wants and does the community really want these size of you know these 300 unit developments or do they are they satisfied with 100 150 um, I believe from speaking with lots of people and I own a retail store here so I speak with a lot of people that aren't just my friends but people that just come in walking in also and um, that this community is still thinking we're growing too fast the traffic is crazy you have to wait four lights at seven in the morning to get to my daughter to school you have to wait for like four lights so the traffic impacts are not discussed and you can say oh the planning board will deal with that but um, this is really a policy decision I know it seems as though the council is treating it like just oh it's just an administrative little detail because we we have it in the ordinance but when we looked at 135 units plus reserve we talked about what that meant in terms of dollars and cents it was a policy decision and I don't feel like you guys have even had a discussion about the policy part of it um, I just heard the school departments already looking at another school building and you did say I, I think Dan said 10 one out of 10 the report that I think my sister might have given you and also I or no I didn't send actually but um, that I talked about in my letter to you today indicates more like 22 students per hundred as opposed to 10 per hundred. that's not negligent that's 190 students in our school and depending on where they're located and if you listen to the school board anywhere if they're in one area we need a new school already so character of our town is also very very important it's not just about does does the community actually want something this size and I would argue that um, that the community might they've changed it but I sat in a housing alliance meeting and I pushed in November and December and I said you know what we should make this a mandatory we should make affordable housing mandatory um, in projects over a hundred or hundred and fifty and you know what I was told by staff oh that's too fast now see I brought that up in November or December staff told me that was pushing it too fast and yet this workshop you guys just got it had it in December and now you're making a decision on it I've been sitting on the Affordable Housing Alliance for 15 years I don't think it was too fast I think that now is the time prior to you guys making this decision that you mandate that these 
new apartment complexes have some affordable units, not just pay the loo and fee. Again, I don't think it is too fast for 15 years. Um, and I think that we all know we need affordable housing. We don't need luxury housing. That's what the growth management ordinance is. These reserve pools are going to be required because the two new developments coming in over at High Gazette are luxury apartments, not because they're affordable. That's what the reserve was for, affordable. So I just hope you think about that and think about perhaps talking about it a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Richie Axelson and I live at 8 Colby Drive. Um, and I, I tend to agree with the last two people that spoke. Um, I was born and raised in Portland, Maine, and uh, I came from a, a, a medium income family. And in Portland, um, my wife and I recently moved to Scarborough a year and a half ago and we built a home here. And when we did that, we put a lot of thought into that and we looked at surrounding communities such as Cumberland and Falmouth and we looked at Scarborough um, a, a, as a possible community. Uh, my wife and I also own multiple income properties and I, I really agree when you look at this situation to define affordable housing. In Portland, when I was there, I attended many council meetings, and when they said affordable housing, that equaled low-income housing. And what that brought in is people below normal income levels, which created crime. And then after you seen the way that these houses, houses were, were, were kept up, it creates character, as she had said. So I would urge you very strongly to look at this because, as Mr. Donahue had said, with this comes a lot more cost. And uh, if you're talking about public works um, having to supply manpower, manpower is going to have to be you know, up there. Um, that might mean you have to add additional trucks or equipment to that. Um, you're definitely going to have to add more manpower. I can't even imagine how this wouldn't impact the schools. Um, and, and, and having to hire more teachers or, or so forth. So I would strongly urge, um, I would strongly urge the council to relook at this. And also, again, um, we love living here in Scarborough. And when my wife and I decided to build a house here, um, we could have built in many of different places. But we chose Scarborough because it's a very comfortable neighborhood. Please keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mo Erickson. I live in uh, Pine Point and I have for all my life. My husband is also from Scarborough. So um, I want to just keep, have everybody keep in mind the character of Scarborough. It's surely not what it was 40 years ago or t even 20 years ago. Now uh, when I'm driving into my job in Portland, I feel like I'm on uh, Route 1 in Saugus sometimes um, with the lights and the traffic. It's it's really crazy in the morning. Um, and I think the number of permits is going to be too high. That's all I want to say is that um, you mentioned that there may not be that much of a burden on the, the mere commoners such as myself. But I, I am pretty sure that I'm going to be up here again in a year or two complaining about two things. My taxes going up again and still no pool. So with that said, if you are going to give this gargantuan number, let's have a pool. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Carrie Anderson, uh, currently Port Street and formerly of 8 Puritan Drive where I was uh, raised. So good to see someone from the neighborhood. Um, I don't want to cast any doubt on what uh, Dan had uh, talked to about here before um, the public hearing was opened up. Nor do I want to um, um, demystify any of the comments that some of these for the other folks have brought up because I think they all raise legitimate points, to be honest with you. Uh, but, what I, but what I also have to say is that a um, couple few things. One is the current rate of multifamily that is being proposed in town is, is definitely not sustainable. It's going to come to an end. And um, when it does, there's going to be chairs that are going to be filled and people left standing. What I will say is if it doesn't have it in Scarborough, you're going to have it somewhere else. 
uh, because they will go to another town. And the only thing that I can say with respect to um, some of what Dan talked about is, and again, I don't want to cast any doubt, but maybe I can add some clarification. We're right now building out a project that this April 1st, a uh, dubious day seems to be, uh, will be 20 years that we've been spending money and um, across the street here off the Eastern Road, Eastern Village. And I can't begin to tell you the challenges with trying to plan, engineer, build through recessions, terrorist attacks, uh, demographic shifts and everything else. So um, we are uh, still trying to figure our way. But currently at the build out, which we're about a quarter of the way, if maybe a third, I wish we were a lot further, um, what the town is receiving annually is $472,000 a year. And in that project, there's 10 kids. In the last five years, we've uh, built about 50 to 60 homes in there. And we've only had four families with kids. There's only 10 kids in the neighborhood. So demographics have definitely shifted. And I think that train has long ago left the station. You're never going to see it back. There's many reasons why, or there's a few reasons why, big reasons, the demographics being the lesser of them. But that is done. 325 build permits a year, families in Scarborough, it's over. It's never going to be back. And I'd be happy to share more reasons why, but the demographics, again, being the least of which. The only other thing I would say is, um, with respect to, um, you know, I, first off, I support the, the raising of the pool of permits because that seems to be what's on the table. Um, if that's not going to happen, it seems that that being what's on the table, it, uh, I don't or I can't support anything else. Um, if you don't approve that, then at least approve projects that already do have standing in town that do uh, provide, that already have multifamily projects approved and at the same time are providing affordable housing and aren't just putting into the lieu fee, if you will. And I do believe that other apartment projects that are built in town should have affordable housing in them rather than paying the in lieu fee, which is what we're doing and we support it. We've been trying to do it and we're going to be doing it. So with that, I could talk probably a lot more about it. I see my time is up. Um, the only other thing I can say, I guess, is um, I think everything that's been discussed tonight is, is our legitimate points. Um, but, um, you know, there has been a fair amount of change in Scarborough from when I was a kid, and there was three police cars in this town. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at it outside of Maine, we're really just still a small town. We really are. You take into account autonomy, robotics, artificial in intelligence, and really, um, we're in a really kind of a lucky place to be. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, I hadn't really planned to speak on the topic tonight, um, as um, I wasn't aware that you know some of the building permits, uh, w the reserve list, I guess, I guess was previous used, um, previously used uh, for affordable housing. I, I, I do agree with that, but I, I have uh, done a fair amount of research on uh, these apartments, and I, I found an interesting article online a while ago. Um, it was called "Overcoming the Opposition of Multifamily Rental Housing," and it was written by Mark. Aub um, Obrensky and Deborah Stein uh, for the Joint Center for Housing Studies of Harvard University. Um, basically, it talks about um, that the uh, average family household is shrinking and the United States population is continuing to grow. Um, they go into detail with st statistics um, saying, you know, Households are becoming more like 2.6 people, where a couple of years ago was more up in the three range. And then uh, with the increase in population at about 0.83%, in the next 20 years, we're going to have another California's worth of people in this country. So I definitely see that there is a point that the country is growing to build these multifamily housings. Um, the article also interestingly goes into sort of um, the fears that communities have against multifamily housings. 
um, specifically that they're transient people, that they don't care about their community, that they just kind of come and go, that they, they have no ties. Um, the article actually, f their findings from it were that they are uh, just as involved in their community as everyone, except for in one category, um, which is in their local politics. Um, so, you know, they probably won't show up to the meetings, but you probably see them around town and, and participating just as anybody else does in the town. Um, so if, if you are sort of fearful of this idea of multifamily housing in the community of Scarborough, it, it, is, it is coming. Um, so be prepared, but definitely take take a little bit of time and read this article. It, it does go into detailed depth, um, and it, it does a very good job at citing where it got all its sources. But I do agree with some of the points that, you know, um, if we're increasing the reserve list just to accommodate a project um, where previously the reserve list was for um, uh, uh, the Section 8 housing or affordable housing, I'm not sure what the difference is are myself, myself, but um, if that is the case, we should probably table this and maybe rethink about it. Uh, that was a good point, I, I believe. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else I'd like to speak? On once, twice, we'll close the public hearing. And um, for our uh, discussion, what I'd like to do is actually read the motion. Um, I'll, I'll read the motion because it's actually not on the agenda, but uh, it's in the memo from the Long Range Planning Committee. So I'll read the motion, ask for a second, and then we can open it up to questions for staff uh, and then comments after. So I would move that the Town Council approve the increase of reserve pool permits, excuse me, from 215 to 500 in an effort to meet the current demands and thus allowing the proposed projects to proceed as allowed under current zoning. Second. Um, Questions for staff and Mr. Bacon regarding the presentations, Mr. Rowan. Uh, Mr. Bacon, could could you are you familiar with the zoning ordinance? Could, could you um, <laughs> let's could you define so. for us affordable housing and vis-a-vis -vis Section 8 as we have it defined in our ordinance? Yeah, we don't define Section 8, um, and when the town council and um, planning board are talking about affordable housing, uh, they're talking about um, Basically, we have a definition in the zoning ordinance that says that um, affordable housing is either, I think, home ownership or rental housing where the, uh, the occupant makes 80% um, or their income is 80% of the area median income. Um, and that there's a calculation to figure that out. It's based on the number of occupants in a home or in the dwelling and there's factors for paying for utilities and other things other than just rent or your mortgage. So it's 30% of your income going towards housing and um, that amount being 80% of the area median income. And the area would be the, the Portland area. Um, I don't think it's the county. I think it's a more localized area around Portland. Um, so that's, I mean, Section 8 housing is... Um, entirely different thing um, that's, that the town doesn't have as a zoning bonus or any kind of sort of land use uh, encouragement to, to create affordable housing. Or that's the definition for affordable housing for the community. Thank you. Um, if, if I could add just for the public and for the record, um, the definition that Mr. Bacon was referencing as well as uh, Council Rowan is Chapter 405 of the ordinances. It's um, Section 4 and I believe it's on page 37. Other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, and a couple of questions, just a couple of clarifying questions. So sure. the, the proposal to increase the permits to 285 <clears throat> was based on sort of the, the projects that are in the pipeline to accommodate all of them? Is that is that the methodology that we arrived at from 215 to 285? That's, um, that is the methodology. Um, and on this sheet that Tom yep. handed out, um, it says potential <coughs> growth permits from reserve pool at 465. So that is the precise need, but right. we included so a little fudge factor because of uh, the fact that some of these projects can pull some permits from the annual allocation, so they may not. So there's, it's, it's approximate. 
so, so really the process was based on what the developers were putting on the table, not necessarily public input or, in, in particular, my next question was going to be, and, and as you went through the history of, and I have something here I'll read in a second, but as I understand at the last workshop, we had two individuals that got up and said, gee, the last comprehensive planning process that you referenced, where we did an atti attitude survey of 6,500 residents in Scarborough, we actually asked the residents of Scarborough what they wanted, what they wanted for the community, we got some input. We actually had a developer said that based on that input in the process that the zoning and things that we had developed really was done well. Mm -hmm. And as I understand the heritage of sort of the growth ordinance, the reason that we had, we stopped the rollover, it wasn't, it, it was not only the total number of buildings that are, is occurring, but we were also worried about how quickly those were coming online because it might impact services and other things. So when we look at this and we think about adding 850 units in the next year or two, which is what we're talking about, so I think, I think that's something we, we should consider or think about. Was that, so is that an accurate reflection of why we went from the rollover to a set pool bank was really to control how quickly, how fast we could grow in any period of time? I'm most aware of the reason for the reserve pool being a separate bucket of permits that really acts as a, a guarantee or incentive to do projects the town wanted to see. Because in 2008, in the past comprehensive plan, doing Scarborough affordable housing, meeting Scarborough's definition yes. for affordable housing was important and looking at doing projects that uh, involve land conservation or paying fees towards land conservation okay. and developing in our growth areas was strongly encouraged. So it was viewed as if there's a reserve pool where developers know they can get permits and not have to worry about competing for the annual permits. They know they can go over here and get permits that that's a way to be more likely to do that type of project. So, but, but couldn't you argue the reason it was set at 215 or at some number? I mean, it was just a rollover, as you suggested. What's the number at the point in time? Mm -hmm. But there was an upper limit to how quickly it, things could develop in a period of time, and if there needed to be additional uh, development, it had to come back to some type of process. Sure, that's it had to come to the council to add, to replenish it to add mm -hmm. adequate. Right, and, and again, I yeah. think the last time we met at the workshop, <clears throat> there was some conversation about the council is obligated to replenish the pool. But as I read the ordinance, what it really says is we may replace the pool. There's there's no obligation on our part to replace it. So, my only concern is, and as you know, and you passed out this, and I do have a question about this. We're saying, based on your estimates, there's 55 um, students. And you mentioned that the impact fee should more than cover the cost of, of schooling and that type of stuff. The impact fees, I believe, are one time, right? Yeah, yeah. school. So, so the total facility. impact fee, one time impact fees for all these units we're talking about is $864,000. Mm -hmm. And with 55 students at $13,000 a year, that's our average cost. We don't know what the incremental cost is. No one has provided an incremental cost to students. That's $700,000. So. The impact fee covers one year of education, and then there is an impact on the budget and other things. And this is estimating, as was pointed out, there's other estimates that suggest that there's 22 students per 100 units, which means this number could be anywhere between 55 and 187. And if we had any conversations with the school about what 187 students, and I would suspect based on some of the facilities conversations we've had, the distribution of those students, whether they're evenly dispersed between <coughs> all grades or whether they're predominantly, you know, K through six, has a huge implication on our facility management and what we have. Was that discussed as part of the long range planning committee? When you said there's no impact, were those types of things discussed? Um, I need to back up a little bit on the impact fees in that we have impact fees, school impact fees, and the way impact fees work is you aren't allowed under state law to charge an impact fee for operating costs. No, so I, impact I, I, fees are facil for facilities. No, I, I, so understand, for I, I understand that, but the implication was that we're getting significant revenue from impact fees that we're going to offset the educational costs. No, I, I, so I tried to imply that we're getting significant revenue for school expansion if you compare it with the amount of school kids forecasted to come out of these units. Because um, through this scenario, these multifamily <coughs> projects with these projections, 
have a lot fewer school kids than a single family development would if you compare it to how much they would pay. So these multifamily projects are paying more than a single family neighborhood would pay in terms of the school impact fee uh, contribution. Um, in terms of the statistics that others are providing, I don't know what their methods were for calculating that. We based our statistics on samples that exist in the community mm -hmm. based on bedrooms. So 22 students per 100 units could be based on predominantly three bedroom units, which aren't what's proposed here. I'm not sure. Um, but Foxcroft Apartments, which is a two bedroom housing project, averages less than 0.1 school kids per unit. So that's what we used. Mm -hmm. um, and also the project in Westbrook has one and two bedroom units and they average 0 0.05 school kids per unit. So that's in line with what we're providing. Um, and for three bedroom units, we're saying there is, there's a, there's a lot more school kids. There's 0.4, which might get closer to that 22 per per hundred. So I think the devils are in the details in terms of the unit style, yep. size, bedrooms, and also for better or for worse, kind of price point. I mean, luxury apartments, where the certain amenities are dictating certain types of tenants that families would prefer not to pay the prices that they're seeking when they can buy a single family house or they can rent a single family house. That might be the same price point. So I think multifamily housing, there's a wide spectrum of types of multifamily housing and I understand a lot of the comments earlier and there's a lot of people's different experiences with different types of this right. attached housing. So I think that so there's some unknowns, and, and so, and so my, my concern is going back to rapid development rather than sort of steady, even pace of development. If we approve all of these, then we're going to have all of these units in the pipeline with some unknowns about education as we just talked about. I haven't heard any conversation around public safety. But let me, let me come back and let me ask. So yeah, if I can just interrupt for a second. So I want to make sure that our questions are constructive and that they're put into the context in which staff can answer them without necessarily engaging in a, an opinion-based conversation because that really should happen with us as a council. Okay. So if we can kind of narrow that um, because um, the opinion side of that is really our conversation, <coughs> I believe, if you don't mind. So I guess, I guess the only two questions I have then is on the two, the two biggest units, Divide Capital at 288 and Commercial Place at 330 units. Has there been any public comment on those yet? I don't, in the process, because we haven't gotten public comment on those yet, have we? There was limited public comment. I think um, a few folks spoke at your first reading for Divine Capital, and there's an upcoming public hearing um, that will be had by the Planning Board. And then the Council will have a public hearing as part of your contract zone amendment process for Divine Capital. Um, so that would, would be the opportunity for more input on that project. Commercial Place LLC is a, um, that's only in its, say, infancy. It's allowed by zoning um, in basically Enterprise Business Park. They've only taken one initial step to come to the planning board for a very conceptual discussion. They are, um, you know, frankly, kind of waiting on decisions around growth permits um, to see, you know, how they move forward with the project uh, in that one of the tricky things about this whole issue is that the zoning, except for the contract zones, the zoning allows for these projects already. And the growth management ordinance is simply the, I don't say simply, I don't want to minimize it, but it's, it's the ability for them to build out the project. And lenders get really nervous when they don't know if the project can be built out. So the town in some ways is saying, yes, you can do the project. In other ways saying, well, maybe you can do the project um, given our growth permits. So, it, so there's a few projects that are really waiting on clarity around, can we get permits to do this um, even though the zoning allows them to occur? And I think the Commercial Place LLC is in that bucket of projects and once this is decided, they'll come to the planning board and there'll be, there'll be planning board meetings at which public can comment on the particulars of that project. And just one last question. So if we approve these permits, 
then nothing comes back. The, the actual approval of projects are with the, the planning board. It doesn't come back to the council in any shape or form. There's, on the list that you have in front of you, there's five projects. And three of them are already allowed under zoning. Was there a project the council approved the zoning to, for that to occur? 79 Muzzy Road. So that just now goes to the planning board. And they do their development review process. KDA development, Carrie Anderson's project, that's already approved um, by the council under zoning, but also by the planning board. So that's just looking for growth permits and building permits. Divine Capital is coming back to you for a contract zone amendment. So that's a decision the council makes, whether that project moves forward. Commercial Place LLC is allowed by zoning, so that's something the planning board looks at under development review. Doesn't isn't considered by the council. And this Foxcroft Apartments LLC one, that one is just an idea. It's a potential contract zone. So that's something the council would consider and you'd decide whether okay, So the answer to the question is once we approve permits, unless it's some type of contract zone exception, it doesn't come back to the council. Correct. So three out of the five would not come back to you. Okay. No, that was my question. Thank you. Okay. So uh, a couple couple questions. Um, first one, Dan, is it possible, uh, I know three of these projects in front of us um, do have affordable housing concepts or, or parts of them. Could you tell me which one and at what percentage? The Risbera Brothers project, 79 Muzzy Road, mm -hmm. is planning on doing our affordable housing density bonus, which means that for the units that are beyond the normal allowed number, 40% of those need to be affordable. Okay. KDA development um, is already approved to do a um, similar arrangement, and they're providing affordable units in their multifamily. Divine Capital is... Sorry, so, sorry, so KDA is similar, 40% affordable? I think it's not that... 10% 10 10 affordable, 10%. okay. 12% okay. affordable. 12%, okay. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Divine Capital is a contract zone, so you're talking to them about what their affordable requirement may need to be. Commercial Place is not required to do affordable housing. And Foxcroft Apartments, again, that's one that's only in the idea stage, and they know about the need to, uh, they're interested in doing affordable housing. Or the other density bonus, which is development transfer. So one or the other. Okay. Um, Follow-up for good? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, what step is the growth permit in the process for development? So you've got conceptual, um, you've got you know, design, you've got permits, I would assume then financing and then planning and everything. Where are we, if we authorize these growth permits, where is that in the development process? So the typical process is you go to the planning board, you get approval for a subdivision or a residential project. Mm -hmm. and. After approval, you get your plans together for your building plans and you come pull a growth permit and that's your ticket to then get a building permit. And very rarely do developers get nervous about availability of growth permits because they're typically in the annual allocation. They're typically guaranteed to get the 10 single family house permits they need every year or get the, um, you know, the, maybe the 10 growth permits they need for a townhouse or whatever. Um, these projects are mm -hmm. unique, particularly Divine Capital and Commercial Place LLC. They're big projects, obviously, um, and therefore they need a lot more growth permits than are typically available, and that's why they are seeking clarity around this reserve pool. Um, so they're asking about it a lot earlier than another, a normal developer would because their ask is, is different and bigger, and their lenders are saying, we need to know you're going to get planning board approval and building permits, not just planning board approval. So that's really why this is before you, is giving them certainty around the zoning actually can enable a project. So is it, is it fair to say then that obviously Risbera, KDA, um, and uh, Risbera and KDA certainly have already been in front of planning, correct, for their initial request? KDA is approved and they're done with the planning okay. board. Risbera has started but has more work to do. Okay. Um, any other one of these approved or on the docket for planning? Divine Capital is headed to planning board 
Um, the second step in a contract zone is to go to the planning board to get have a public hearing and get preliminary site plan approval before they come back to you. And commercial, commercial place, place is just started and they're waiting on clarity around, around growth permits before they spend soft costs, before they spend money to get permitted. And how long does that typical process take once they, once they let's say, you know, uh, commercial place in Foxcroft, uh, if they haven't started yet, once they get into the conceptual phase and decide to pull growth permits, how long does that process usually take? Ballpark. I mean, that's not for the developers. Um, two, oh, I, I understand <laughs> that. But. Two to four months. Um, you know, it depends on the complexity of the project. If it's super complex, it'll take longer. But, you know, two to, two to five months. So then based on that, um, and I think you commented this earlier, uh, the chances of every single one of these units coming online this year before we complete the comprehensive development plan is, is, is what? Good, bad, 50%, 80%, 100%? Um, very low percentage that all these projects will come online. What, pr what developers are going to do are, is they're going to build to the market. So Rosbera is going to build a unit lease it up, and as they see leasing and renting going well, they're going to build the next one. They're going to build out their projects incrementally based on, based on market demand. The larger projects, Divine Capital might do, you know, two to three phases where they do, um, you know, a third of the project and then reassess and then do a third of the project and then reassess. Um, and as that occurs, other developments in the region are happening, so maybe some of these don't move forward because South Portland's got a project and saco has got a project and Falmouth's got a project. So this is a regional marketplace for these, and that's why I think there's a pretty good chance that some at the end of the list may not move forward or may move forward in a much different way or smaller way. So again, if I could just do, so the 288, let's say for Divine Capital, that's their total, if I recall, that's the total amount of growth permits for the entire project from beginning to end. That's the total number of units. So, I'm sorry, total yep. number of units from beginning yep. to end. So out of that 288 or the 180 growth permits they need, they may only pull 90 this year for phase one. Right. Or a fraction of that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Councilor Foley. Um, so kind of playing off of Chris's point there, if those larger projects are expected to be phased out in such a way, then why the need to more than double our reserve pool when we're not guaranteed they're using it for what the reserve pool is for, which is those, those very specific things outlined in the ordinance, the, the affordable housing piece, the, um, I forget the list of laundry items that you, you said go with the reserve pool or what the reserve pool was intended for. Um, and I know that's asking you to be somewhat speculative. Um, well, I know for a fact the Commercial Place LLC, they, they qualify for the reserve pool under the category that they're an existing subdivision that's um, doing housing as part of a mixed-use project. That's one of the criteria. They, they don't need all the growth permits tomorrow. They need certainty that in the next four years they can get all the growth permits. So that's really the ask of the reserve pool being increased, is not using all the permits in the reserve pool, it's certainty that when, for phase two, in 2021, when we come to get a p permit for 60 units, that there'll be permits available. So Understood, that's good, but going back to what Peter said earlier, just the, and my question was, once we approve this, we, we can't take it back. It's in the pool, and then the planning board has it. It doesn't come back to the council. It doesn't come back to the council, but there's only Unless specific. It's a contract zone. There's only specific categories that the planning board can allocate. So it's not open to everybody. It's only open to the projects that you see on this, this yep. sheet. Thank you. Yep. That's just an important point. All the projects on this sheet qualify under one or more of the qualifications a previous council set. Um, a previous council, whether you agree with that policy decision or not, agreed that certain types of projects deserve special consideration. And all of these projects on the sheet that we put before you fall into one or more of those categories. So we're not making any special exception for these groups. They qualify. Council Rowling? <coughs> Some of the concerns I heard um, over the past couple of days 
have been around um, infrastructure, uh, police, fire, traffic impact. Can you speak to any of those um, uh, for, for these particular projects? Yeah, um, kind of the interesting thing about, I would say the majority of these projects is that they're in what used to be or has been viewed as commercial kind of growth areas. Um, so uh, the Vine Capital Project was hoped to be an office park. Um, Enterprise Business Park wanted to be more, more another phase of business park in um, 79 Muzzy Road is a commercial kind of mixed-use area. So there are areas that um, in the first two cases have been, been permitted for a certain amount of traffic impact um, and, and out of most areas in town are pretty well suited to handle additional traffic generation. That's not to discount the fact that there's a lot of congestion on Route 1. There certainly is. But there are areas that have infrastructure to accommodate, you know, fairly intense commercial or, or in this case, multifamily growth. So traffic provisions are handled really like commercial developments handled. You know, you pay impact fees, you need to do off-site improvements if they're warranted to keep the system as, as good as it, you know, not make the system any worse than before you started. Um, so traffic is kind of dealt with in that way by the planning board and, and they go about it the same way a commercial developer would. Um, the other KDA, you know, carries gone through his traffic permitting and, and has done some things for that. So I think traffic is manageable um, and, and we have systems in place for it. Um, the fire department, you know, that's, that's something um, that we're looking at where there is more demand on kind of annual inspections, making sure the multifamily buildings are safe. Um, and so we've had some internal discussions around um, ensuring that uh, we can deliver those services and, and looking at that. I know the council's talked about kind of fees associated with larger retail. You know, what's a way to kind of deal with that? Um, but I think multifamily compares to retail at least is is easier to manage from a you know police department standpoint, um, and you know I think out of the services, public safety, you know fire emergency response is probably going to be the most demand on the town versus public works versus the schools based on research. So there, there's going to be some some additional demands, but there's also sort of the tax revenue that um, should compensate for that or or, or beyond. I believe at one point we, we uh, whether it was the workshop or perhaps uh, the divine presentation, uh, mm -hmm. there was some some mention of um, comparisons between use of that uh, uh, area as um, residential versus commercial, and the impact of um, traffic actually being um, considerably less at yeah. peak hours. Can you speak to? compares to retail development, multifamily housing is 20% the traffic generation. So if you did Gateway, well, it used to be Gateway Square, the Divine Capital site. If that was all retail, there would be, it would be five times the amount of traffic generation than a multifamily project. Office is um, maybe two times. You know, office has is higher traffic demands, but not like retail. So if you compare it to the commercial development that, that could happen there, um, it's a lot less traffic generation. Um, yeah. um, and another unrelated question, but do, do we have a sense for, had we been continuing to roll over permits um, and not stopped in 2008, do you have a sense for kind of where that, that pool would be currently, how many kind of didn't growth we, permits did not get used over the past We calculated years? at 700 or 702 to so 700. Um, that's principally sort of the 2008 to 2012 time frame when we saw 40 or 50 growth permits versus you know 100 or 110 like we're seeing now. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, one, I, I just had one other question. Do you, have, do you have an idea for how many other, um, you mentioned Fox Cross, um, I think I'm getting that right. Existing uh, multifamily um, developments in town. Do you have any sense for how many we currently have um, around town? Probably, you know, 10 to 15. I'm going to guess. 10 to 15 developments in each type of units. 
Um, I'm sorry. Do you have any any idea how many units? Overall number of units. I think he ran. I guess. 1,200 maybe. I, we can get that number for you. Um, I think it's in that in that range. Um, kind of the interesting thing about rental versus ownership is from like a land use stand, a zoning standpoint, a rental versus a condo, it's the same use. So um, we shouldn't necessarily just think of these as rentals versus ownership because these projects could convert to condos without any town involvement. So divine capital could be proposed as 288 condos um, and they're classified the same way. So we should probably, if we're thinking about how many, say, attached units we have in town, we could probably include condos to give you a better sense for that. that that's good enough for me. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to okay. follow up on something that Councilor Rowan said um, as far as uh, fire and safety. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that most of these are all managed by their own management company. Um, and usually when you go into those units, you sign a contract with them. And I know that, um, the, I know specifically the Rivera project, um, first fire, fire bills you, fire and rescue bills you if they come to get you. Um, so that's no impact on the town per se. And then for the police department, I know that Rivera's project, if you, um, have the police call to your unit more than twice, you're gone, done. So that's a stipulation in their contract. So that, again, is something so that we don't have to worry too much about at least police impact on that side of it. So I just wanted to kind of mention that because I think that I was unaware of that piece of it um, until I met with a couple of builders to ask them about these projects that are in the works. Thank you. Uh, this may be more of a question for Karen, um, but when we talked about um, the need for housing in the area, there's been some questions about is that really a, a justifiable need or where, that, where those numbers came from. Could, could either one of you address where those uh, statistics came from? Was it, a, was it a regional, city of Portland, GP Cog, state? You know, where, where did we get the kind of general basis of the, of the need assessment for, for multifamily? I know of a HUD study, and Karen may know of other studies, but HUD did a, Housing and Urban Development did a study that suggested there was over 2,000 multifamily units. There was demand or market for over 2,000 multifamily units in the greater Portland area. Um, I think that's a government, kind of obviously a government-sponsored study, uh, I think, and Ben Devine and Carrie Anderson and others probably could speak to it more specific to their projects, but they, for lending purposes, often do with market studies to justify investment in their projects. And sometimes those are more comprehensive or, or handled a little bit differently. So they may have additional information that um, uh, provides similar statistics, but that HUD study is what's been referred to often. And sorry, just follow up. When was that? What was the date of that HUD study? Just, gen I mean, in the last. 18 months, it, a year. It was 2015. 2015? Okay. Thank you. If I could, I just want to point out, I mean, uh, staff, I think we might feel uncomfortable. We're, we're not here advocating for this. We're responding to requests that's come to us. We're trying to educate you on what choices you've already made, what your ordinances say. And so I just really partial protection for Dan. I, I don't want him to feel as though he's defending anything. He's not here proposing a project or advocating for it. We try to be a resource. We've done research to help educate ourselves and in turn educate you. So just please be mindful of that and we're pleased to do what we can to help you in, in your decision. Um, any other, I have a question, but anybody else first? Um, so I just wanna make sure I understand. So based on the way that the motion was made, which talks about current demands and the current projects, this is not a permanent increase of the number of reserve permits. It's a temporary fix that will go away once demand is met. Yeah, the reserve pool has a certain number of permits, and as they're used, it gets drawn down. It doesn't get replenished again until the council decides to add to it. So, right, it's a not a... So the next time that we have to add to it, it could be back in line with the original amount? Correct. Okay. Could be. Yeah. Any other questions for the staff? Thank you very much, Mr. Bacon. Um, with that, turn it over to the council really for discussion and comments um, across the board for everyone. I'll start with whoever would like to go first. 
Council St. Clair. Um, Tom, I know that we, um, Council Rowan had asked a question, we briefly discussed this, but can we just get, for the public, for councillors, for everybody out there, can we get a, a breakdown of the difference between affordable housing and Section 8 housing? The correct, keep, so that we're all in line with every, all on the same page. I will do my best. Thank I'm you. not an expert in this field. Uh, Dan, I think, spoke to what our definition says, and it's 80% of area, uh, average area, area median, area median income. There's a there's a secondary component that also household uh, your housing costs can't exceed 30% uh, of your income as well. Um, those two things uh, typically work in concert, but but they're both important ingredients to that. In my experience, and I'm not an expert, uh, Section 8 housing are much, much lower incomes. So you're in the 40% and, and sometimes below that. It's a whole different conversation. Now, technically, those would still qualify as affordable because they are less than 80%, um, but that's typically not what we're, we're talking about when we're talking affordable housing. It's 80%, and just until recently, it was 120, believe it or not, but it's now 80%. Okay. okay. Thank you. I hope that... I hope that helps clear up a little bit for some people out there because that's a question that I've gotten repeatedly numerous times. Um, uh, I know that this is a frustrating thing and I know that we've gotten a lot of emails and a lot of questions and there's some diversity on the council about it. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I guess my issue isn't necessarily with what's being asked of us at this point. My issue is with the fact that I'm a little bit uncomfortable with maybe it's, it, I've been struggling with this for, since this all, since we were presented with this in a package, uh, what, a month or two, two months ago. Um, I've been struggling with um, long range planning and the planning board and, you know, what, the, what we're getting for information beforehand and when we're getting it. And where is that breakdown? Um, and whose breakdown, whose breakdown is it? Um, where does the responsibility lie? Is it, is it solely my responsibility? Have I missed the boat on some of these things? Should I personally be making sure that I'm reading every single um, minute that comes out of every special group? I think that's almost impossible at this point. Um, but maybe that, maybe that is my responsibility. Um, yes, we did approve a lot of these um, projects, and I, I, I do recognize some of them. Um, but I also think that I'm, so, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with maybe the amount of, of power is, is maybe not the correct word, but that's what comes to me with what the planning board and the long-range planning group has. Um, at the end of the day, the council is, are the people that are, are elected to this um, that are elected to these positions and we're the ones that answer to the public, not the planning board and not the long range planning committee. We do. Um, and so it, it bothers me a little bit that we do have this say, but then it's sent back to them, changes are made, and when do we find out about it? So I, I just feel like there's a breakdown somewhere. And I know that there has been some changes made this year. I know Sean's really made it quite, quite an effort. And I don't think that this is any one person in particular's problem. I don't think it's the staff's problem. Um, I don't think it's necessarily anyone on those committees. I think there's a breakdown with a group of people and somewhere it has to be fixed. Because I know, and, wh and whether anyone else wants to admit to it tonight, I know I'm not the only person that was flabbergasted by the number when it was all combined and put together. It wasn't just me, and, and there were people in the public, too, that were surprised by it. So, I, again, I'm not necessarily as concerned with what we're being asked of tonight, although I have, do have a couple of reservations about it. I'm more concerned with the, the, the further on down the road and what happened to get us to where we are tonight. Um, and so that's something that I plan on looking more into and uh, making sure that I'm not surprised like this again. I don't, I'm not going to ever feel like this again. Um, whether or not these were presented to the council is one thing, and I know that they were, and I understand that, because we, I know we keep being told that. The problem is when you put them all together, it's a very overwhelming number. And yeah, everyone's focusing on this 800 number. 
it's not all going to be, if 800 units are built, I would be shocked. I would be absolutely shocked. Um, I've spoken to numerous contractors at this point. Um, I've done my research. I've done my homework. Um, and I believe in our staff. Um, I st very strongly believe in our staff, and I, and I have the utmost faith in them. Um, and I think that if they're advising us to do something, they know what they're talking about. Um, and I also want to say, a couple of the contractors I spoke to have no bone in this game. So they, they don't care. You know, they, they're not in this. They don't have apartments that are being proposed here. So they, don't, they just know that this is a good, they believe this is a good move for Scarborough. Um, that being said, um, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm probably going to support this to go through, um, but I am going to be doing my own research and following up on some things um, and not taking this lightly. Um, I don't like surprises. I don't think the public likes surprises. And whether or not these were put in front of us at different times is not the issue. The issue is they're being presented as a lump and that is what is overwhelming people, I think. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, just a quick process question. Tonight, as I understand it, this is, I mean, usually we have a first reading and second reading, but that's not what we're doing tonight, right? Tonight's a public hearing and whatever is decided tonight is, is, is it, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. It's, it's yeah. somewhat of a unique circumstance, but the, the, the ordinance provides for this and uh, yeah. we've consulted with the town attorney that, that it requires a vote of council once and done. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure it's clear to everybody that this that this won't be coming back. If this is a, a one and done tonight, I just wanted to clarify that. So I'll reserve some comments for later. Thank you. Council Chiazzo. So uh, a couple of things. Um, to put my spectacles on. hate that now. Um, I, 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 like many of you, heard from uh, a, a good dozen or so people, both email and phone, um, um, most of them not in favor of this. Um, I, I did want to correct some things. I even heard some at the podium tonight of the discrepancies, if you will, with facts. Um, I think it's very important that we're all on the same page when it comes to that stuff. So some of the things I'd like to clarify, um, they're not 850 units being proposed. It's 800. Section 8 is not coming in in any of these. Um, the school department is looking at a new school potential, not necessarily because of Im increased student population, but because of the degradation of the three um, uh, neighborhood schools. That's what was talked about in the facilities planning. So it's not necessarily a, a, a population thing. It's more of an infrastructure type of arrangement. Um, not to say that that won't have an impact, but that's not the driving factor with them looking for a new school. That's my understanding of it, at least at this point. Um, the time frame is too fast. I, I think we're, we're following everything procedurally the way we're supposed to. There's nothing uh, that's been asked to be expedited. There's nothing that's been asked to be exceptional. Uh, everything, including the contract zoning amendment, is following within the normal protocols and parameters of how the council is supposed to operate and is expected to operate. And I think we need to honor that and maintain that, um, both for our benefit and for the community and the, and the business community's benefit. Um, impact fee for education. Um, we've talked about this over uh, several times. The impact fees are designed for infrastructure improvements. They are not designed for operational expenditures. That's what taxes do. That's what, inc that's what property taxes are for. So um, yes, we may be getting a certain amount for um, impact fees, but that's only for infrastructure. The operational impacts come out of the regular tax base like everybody else. Uh, did some quick math here. Um, the 55 kids with the 800 units, every year, if we had 135 single family homes based on the information staff gave, that's 108 kids in the district every single year based on 135 single family homes. If we had 800 single family homes in lieu of these 800 multifamily units, that's 640 additional kids in the system. So yes, there's going to be kids coming in to the system. But let's put it into perspective. Um, I, I pulled some statistics, some growth statistics out from our population. Okay? In 1990, uh, between 1990 and 2000, we grew 35.6% from 12,500 to, to almost 17,000. From 2000 to 2010, we went from 17,000 to almost 19,000. Okay? That's an 11.5% increase. Esti these, are, these are census figures. 2014 estimate, we're at 19,524, which is a 3.2% 3 3 increase. People are moving to Scarborough. 
That's a fact. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. We need a diverse community. We need to have growth in order to have sustainable tax bases. This is the best form of investment for us in terms of our return on investment. Yes, it's going to cost money in services. Everything we do in town is going to, but when you look at the cost-benefit ratio, I think multifamily units, in conjunction with single-family units, provide us with the best opportunity to grow the tax base with the minimal impact on our, our fees and infrastructure. And, and last but not least, we're not in a position here to argue the benefits of each individual project. That's what the planning board does. We're looking at this from a perspective of what does the ordinance direct us to do? We're looking at do we want to increase the number of growth permits or not? And if we do, what amount do we want to do that in? That's the, uh, that's the discussion we should be having, not the individual merits of each individual project. Most of these have already gone through that, and we have that infrastructure in place with zoning. If it doesn't fit in the zoning or the density requirements, it doesn't even make it to this point. So everything that's on this sheet is something that legally can move forward. The real question is, is it too much too quick? And I think staff's argument that, and, and several counselors made this point, and I agree, all 800 units are not going to come in one year. They're going to be phased in. We have a comprehensive development plan coming next year. With this, even if the majority of these units come, we can address those issues of, is that right for the town? Is this what the town wants to look like? Is this the, the, the type of growth we want? That's where the comprehensive planning process comes into play, not when we're talking about growth permits. So if we have issues on zoning and ordinance and this not being the right number or the right density, there are other venues, I think, to take that up. I don't think it should be taken up here with the issue of growth permits. Thank you. Council Foley. Um, so I have several concerns. Um, the first being uh, that, you know, talk about process, but this is a one-shot deal. And I expressed grave concern when we were talking about a specific project, and I understand that this isn't about a specific project, but I asked very clearly at that time around, um, all right, so how much time do, am I going to have to really kind of get my head around this, to really dig in and do some research and understand the data? Um, and before this comes back our way. And the answer I was given, well, it couldn't possibly be until the end of February, maybe early March, somewhere in there. And I realize that's a little bit different because it was specific to the project, but it's been four weeks and here we are and it's a one-shot deal tonight. So uh, that, that I have huge concern about that. The second thing is that, you know, as Dan was giving his presentation, um, which was very well done, by the way, um, you know, and, and as I've done some, re some initial research, not nearly enough, uh, one of the things that's been clear to me is that councils in the past really took their time with big decisions like this. Uh, Dan talked a lot about this committee and that committee, and, and it was months of uh, kind of coming up to get to those numbers. And again, I feel uh, like we have a very compressed time frame for that. Um, so I would much rather see us <coughs> take a more methodical, you know, learn, take a lesson from history and follow kind of their more methodical approach. Um, I think that's it for now. I think there's going to be more discussion. Council Rowan? Um, so I heard um, a lot of anxiety um, over the past couple of days, um, and I wanted to acknowledge that that's very valid. Um, I think there's a lot of concern when you see this large number of um, housing units that's been proposed to be concerned about what that means for um, change in town. Um, but um, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson spoke to it from the podium that um, this really is a um, kind of a, a singular moment in time in terms of this is a, a um, these are market forces that, it, that are one time um, that, um, that we don't expect to continue. Um, there's um, we're also, if all of these are built out, we'll have depleted our reserve fund uh, of, of permits so that we couldn't continue to build this place at this pace without coming back and, and taking another action to this council. Um, so I feel like the, the biggest driver of the anxiety are the two large, um, uh, large projects, um, the Divine Capital and the Commercial Place. Um, and I... I you know, I look at I look at those projects and, and what we talked about those those two properties. If we were to use them not for residential, but were to use them for either office parks or for um, 
retail um, as some of the other uh, uses that they're zoned for. If you look at their neighboring um, properties, that's how they're built out. You know, the impact on our services are, are higher. Um, and I, I think that probably if you looked at, actually, I, I have no idea, um, but I'm speculating <laughs> that, the, uh, that the taxable valuation might potentially be lower. Um, and uh, I also believe that this use is um, in accordance with our comprehensive plan. Um, it's generally in, in accordance with the, uh, with the zoning. Um, I also believe, um, and Chris spoke to this very eloquently around um, that our, our growth and services plan, excuse me, study around um, the, um, the return on investment for these properties. These are, these are some of the only uses that have a positive ROI. Um, so for uh, those of us like myself that are concerned with um, sustainable tax rates, Building this type of um, um, this type of housing, multifamily housing, actually will uh, lessen the in the inflationary pressures of our tax rate. Um, and I I feel like these and certainly again I'm speaking to the two large um, plans. I haven't seen the the plans for commercial place, but um, I, I'm certain that um, that both of these projects are going to be built somewhere. Um, and they're, they seem like very nice projects, um, and I, I'd like to see them built here. Um, and so uh, while I have reservations about um, impacts and I share uh, the concerns that have been expressed with me, um, I'm going to uh, support this tonight. Thank you. Counselor? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in a slightly different, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of conversation about the business reasons why this makes sense. We've had a lot of conversations why it, it, it may be a housing need in the area. But I go back to where actually Dan started the conversation about we did have a process in the first comprehensive plan, and we have another comprehensive plan coming up. But that process was informed by actually asking who we serve. We actually serve the constituents of the town. We actually serve the people that live here in our community. And the last process, in respect of that, actually surveyed 6,500 homes at the time, asking people what they wanted to have and what was important to them to have in our community as Scarborough, as residents. And I distributed the information today. It was a 1999 <coughs> survey. But there were three things that really guided the process to where we are today. One was there was great concerns about the growth accelerating in Scarborough. And this is in 1990. Um, residents support limiting residential growth, especially longer-term residents. But number nine on their list, which is preserving community character is an important issue of this town. And what they wrote is 68% of resident, residents say that small town atmosphere is an important reason for living in Scarborough. It's the fourth most important reason to be here. 64 of residents argue that commercial properties should conform to standards consistent with a small town atmosphere. So we had a process in place that really guided us to this point in time. What was mentioned by some other counselors, we're, we're starting a new comprehensive planning process. But we're sitting here tonight, really, we haven't asked our, res we haven't asked our residents and our constituents their opinion of what we're talking about. We have, we have spoken to why we think it's important. And I'm really, really concerned that we haven't honored asking our folks. And again, we, this has been a very compressed timetable. And that's my biggest concern. Have we had enough time? I, and certainly, we have all mentioned we've gotten, I got six or seven emails, which is unusual. That's, it, it's a pretty significant, and not one person that sent me something was in support. And probably the best summary is someone wrote three points. I'd like to see more complete analysis of the additional tax revenue generated, additional school and municipal operating costs incurred as a result of the new units. I am concerned about the state of rapid development in town. I am concerned that ta this town's fastest growing community in southern Maine policies will have unintended environmental and quality of life implications. And three, there's been very little opportunity for public input into this matter. I think these are all important. This is what the people we're elected to serve are telling us. So I just think we should honor that. And what I'm concerned, and I, I'd like to offer an amendment that we at least table this until we do some type of survey. If we can do survey work for fireworks and whether we should have fireworks or not, this is certainly a big enough issue that we should at least ask the town residents whether they agree with us or not. We're serving them. They don't serve us. So 
So I'd like to offer that amendment, please. And I would second it. Motion to the table. So uh, <coughs> the motion is, so it's not an amendment, it's an action. So the, the motion is to, um, to table the item, it's been seconded. Um, non -debatable. It is non-debatable. Um, so with that, although I was going to make a comment that I would have liked to have commented, but um, I'll honor the, the request to table without that, but um, it is non-debatable. So um, all in favor of tabling the motion. I saw one. I didn't look on the other side. I apologize. Two. All opposed. Three. Four. So it does not table. Um, so back to the uh, the main motion and conversation. So um, a couple of comments. One is um, there's so many, and I have this really bad habit of scribbling and writing and wanting to bring up everything, and I'm trying to and at the same time be uh, succinct and concise. Um, a comment that was made during the uh, during both by councils as well as by citizens was about that um, the intent of the original work that was done was to manage growth um, and that multifamily homes was part of that. The fact is, is that the purpose of the growth management ordinance was to manage all growth regardless of the type of housing. So while the concern at that time was single family homes, because that's what was coming in at the time, um, <coughs> the preference was actually to move towards other type of homes other than single family my recollection is in the immediate years thereafter, there seemed to be an influx of 55 plus because those were the projects that came in that I think they were uh, Magnolia, Juniper, uh, Bessie, and then even um, Hillside, not Hillside, Hillcrest, um, expansion of Hillcrest. So then there was a concern about, well, what services did they, uh, were they going to start demanding because of that increase? We had the community center who got brought up, which then got turned down. So no matter what type of growth that the cycle or that the market puts before us, there's always going to be a concern about the impact that it has to the community and what is part of that. That's where, to me, the entire comprehensive plan comes into place because it has a useful life. Its useful life is from the day that it is approved until the day it is changed. And I think it is well within the right of this council, as well as any future council, to continue the work that we have been charged with by the voters um, to take into consideration what has been asked before us. You do not need to stop and reevaluate what went into the original plan. And so while the councils have cited um, issues and preferences that were given in the 1990s, the fact is that the last comprehensive plan that went into place was in 2006. In addition, and that's what really is what's precipitated us being here today is that plan because it allowed um, what has happened and the council has taken up in four other situations over the past year. And I will say except for one vote, um, only because the council was absent, every one of the changes to the zone requests that were made for around multifamily was unanimously approved. And if there was a concern about the concentration of housing that should have come, I would think that it would have been contemplated at that time. I understand opinions can change and issues can change and that, um, you know, we rely on other people's information. I rely very heavily on the good citizens that sit on the Long Range Planning Committee, the citizens that sit on our planning board because we cannot be the experts in every area. Their opinion that goes into making the decisions and recommendations is just as important as ours as well as the citizens who share their opinion. So it's about trying to provide a balance across that board. And, you know, I wanted to suggest is that, you know, I've thought about, you know, where I sit on this. Um, I think um, I am in favor of it um, wholeheartedly. I believe that the actions I've personally taken in voting in each one of the changes supports me making this final decision. Um, the concern that I have isn't around public input um, because they will be able to provide input in the next comprehensive plan that starts. The issue that I had is I wanted to make sure, and that's why the question was that the 500 that we are approving isn't going to be an automatic increase going forward and that as if there are new projects that come forward that they don't somehow get into line, take up the permits and then all of a sudden the existing projects that are already in there because of their phasing now have to come back and we have to add more in order to meet their needs. So um, I believe I understand the intent is that this is for the projects that already are in place and I can support that. Um, the one question that had been asked by citizens that I didn't um, actually respond to by email because I wanted to make it, um, you know, say it here, and that's, you know, why, why do we need to do this now? I think that the diversity of our community is what increases its value. 
Um, the type of housing that's being asked across the board isn't about placement, which has been a big issue about development in the past. The Great American Neighborhood, which was, I believe, 440 units in a very condensed area, was about a neighborhood. These are projects that are all over the place that are actually, in a way, um, complementary, if not better uses than the commercial use that was originally intended. Um, so I think that it's very different than prior citizen initiatives or citizen um, input around development in town, at least from my personal history and perspective. So I'm comfortable in, in approving um, this um, as a solution to the issue, understanding that this will obviously be very closely looked and followed when the new comprehensive plan comes forward. Um, so I think that we've done our due diligence properly. Councillor Foley? Um, so I know this is a little bit of anecdotal uh, evidence, if you will, but one of the things that I've, I'm doing in my professional role is I'm continuing to door knock because apparently I learned how to do it well during the campaign, so I've continued that. And uh, in the past month and a half, I've probably hit at least 150 doors. Uh, and on, sadly, people don't want to necessarily talk about real estate. They want to talk about town business. And I will tell you, I have not had, so this is, again, back to my concern around process and perhaps finding a way to slow down just a little bit. I'm not saying absolutely no, not never. But I, I didn't have a single person uh, tell me they were in support of this, both from a financial standpoint, um, the, the school is a, certainly a concern, but also the cultural piece. And so uh, I, I'm not sure if I would make a motion, but uh, is that how that would happen um, to at least have, a, at a minimum, have a second public hearing on this matter? So uh, it's not required. I suppose the council could add additional rigors to the process if you wished. Uh, so um, to bring, um, actually, I'm sorry, while I was listening, I was actually thinking about Robert's rules. That, in essence, is a tabling motion um, to a time definite so that you could have the second hearing again. So um, if that is what you would like, then you would need a second to table the, table the motion until the next, until a date certain. Second. You've already. And what is the date certain? What date? Because that needs to be part of the motion. Our next meeting. So February 1st. And the, uh, it's not debatable because it's a tabling motion. Um, all those in favor of tabling the, mo uh, tabling the motion? One and two. All opposed? Four. So back to the main motion. Any other comments? Councilor Chiasso? Sorry. Again, I'll, uh, I'll reiterate three of the points that I made earlier. Um, I don't think we're moving too fast. We're within the purview of the, of the ordinances. Uh, we have an obligation to the business community and to the community at large to do things in a timely manner. It's our, it's our job. Um, I believe that very strongly. Uh, if we slow things down every time that we have to make decisions, then you don't need a council. You can put everything out to referendum and let the people decide everything. I don't think that's what we're here for. Um, the second part was that uh, the survey that was quoted from 1990, there were 12,000 people in town in 1990. There's almost 20 now. So uh, I would dare say that perhaps that might change a little bit between then and now. Um, the third is that I am the liaison to the Long Range Planning Committee. I attended the first meeting, and you'll hear about that in committee reports, but I can tell you that they very thoroughly reviewed this. Um, it wasn't just a happenstance, you know, uh, we agree, let's just move on. Um, this was at least the culmination of my understanding, at least three meetings. Um, they've, they've looked at it very intently, had some very intent and, and uh, thoughtful and meaningful discussions on impact. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we're really talking about, and they, it, what they came up with is this is a, an anomaly. We're not talking about consistent, long-term, multifamily growth. We're talking about, uh, in their opinion, it's, it's, a, it's a short one-time or very short period. Um, having said that, we do have a comprehensive plan coming up, and that to me is the time to start addressing some of the growth needs then. I don't think this is the opportunity to do that. Uh, we have that opportunity for public input through the whole process now and during the comprehensive planning. So I, I really do take exception to the fact that um, it's suggested that we're speeding things up or we're moving too fast. Um, you know, these things are built in for consistency purposes, both for our benefit and for the community's benefit, and I think we have an obligation to fulfill that short of any extenuating circumstances, and I don't think a growth permits uh, rise to that extenuating circumstance at this point. So I'll support the motion, and I think we should move forward with it. That's the St. Clair. I just have two quick points. Um, one, 
to Councillor Rowan, it's interesting that, and I know this probably means nothing at this point to anybody but to myself, but um, you had brought up if we were to put, instead of putting in these housing units, if we were to put in like a Target or a Walmart. Um, it's interesting because uh, Councillor Hayes and I are, are sitting on the new building for the police department, and we've actually talked about the fact that a Walmart or a Target is actually far more um, troublesome um, and requires much more, many more calls and management than um, 150, 200 building person unit. So just a quick little thing there, um, just to follow up on something that you said. And the other point that I wanted to make was, I wanted to be clear, um, uh, something that Councillor Chiazzo said, um, I'm not at all criticizing the Long Range Planning Committee or the public, I mean, I'm sorry, the planning department, I'm tired, I think, um, the planning department. That's not my point here um, at all. My point is the fact that we as a council are seven people that are elected by this town. Do I want to know everything that's going on in this town? Yeah, you're damn right I do. I want to know everything that's going on. Because when I walk out of here, I'm the one that people come to. I'm the one that people ask questions of. So we have to give the answers. We're the ones that have to go out and we put our names out there and we knock on the doors and we put our, our families out there and we do everything to be elected to these seats and we want to know what's going on because we have to be the ones that have to tell you what's going on. And if we can't, if I can't answer a simple email from a constituent because I don't have the answers from a committee, I look foolish. <coughs> I'm the one that looks foolish. So it's nothing against them. My, my um, commentary tonight was more against myself as a counselor. I need to be better prepared, and I want to make sure that I know what's going on at said co, and I want to know what's going on at long-range planning level and what's going on at the planning level. And if I don't know those things, then I need to find out, and I need to find better ways to know. Because when a constituent emails me at 7 o'clock this morning and I don't have an answer for him, it's embarrassing. And I'm not going to, I won't, I'm not moving forward like that. So I think there are some changes that need to be made, and I hope that we all feel that way. Um, I hope that we all want to serve our constituents like that. I think that's a service that we should do. Yes, it's a part-time job. Not even a part-time job, like a really, really, really part-time job. But it's not to us, to the seven of us. We take it very seriously. Thank you. Anything else? Councilor Rowan? I, I only wanted to say uh, uh, that uh, um, I love the idea of the attitudinal survey, and I'm hoping that that will be part yeah. of the comprehensive plan uh, moving forward, because I think that's, that's incredibly Absolutely. important to know. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think that we can slow, slow uh, this decision down to, to wait for that. Any other comments, Councilor Foley? I would just say I would agree with Councilor Council that it, it could be outdated. What I like about what that survey represents is the process that they went by to get the feel of the community and allow for input. So, yeah, I don't know if people feel the same way about things today as they did 15, 16 years ago, but I'd love to know. I'm pretty certain we'll have a very different attitude today than we did 15 years ago. Anything else from everybody? Not seeing any, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the motion as read. Two, three, four. Opposed? Two? Were you opposed? He voted for it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, did you vote for it? I did, but I reserve my right to put it back on the agenda. Okay, so there's five, um, yeah, five to one. Mm -hmm. okay, um, sorry, I lost train of thought there. I was caught off guard, sorry. Um, Next item on the agenda is order number 17-008, act to approve the names posted. Yeah, sorry, act to approve the names posted to the various committees and boards, as recommended by the appointments committee on January 4th, 2017. And with that, uh, for maybe a high-level overview, Councillor Chiazzo as the chair of the appointments. Any additional comments for the appointments? Uh, no comments, but question to the clerk: Do I need to read these into the record? Can wait I can, I'm sorry? You can waive the reading. Okay. I, I, I would request we waive the reading. Does that need to be part of the motion? Okay. So, yep. So, uh, once we, um, so there isn't a motion on the floor yet. So, um, once we have a motion, yep. if you would like to make the motion to get us started. Uh, move approval as presented. Second. And waive the reading. And waive the reading. Sorry, thank you. Second. Comments and questions from council? 
Not seeing any, all those in favor? That is six to zero, thank you. Next item under new business is order number 17-009. Act to set the date for nomination papers to be available to fill a seat on the Board of Education vacated by Catherine Miles with a term to expire in 2018 from Thursday, January 19th, 2017 to close of business on Monday, January 30th, 2017 and set the special municipal election date for Tuesday, February 28th, 2017 to be held at the Scarborough Municipal Building located at 259 U.S. Route 1. Um, I believe I need to, um, any public comments regarding the matter before we have a motion? Not seeing any, um, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Questions and comments? Um, if I could ask maybe uh, either the manager or the clerk, as um, I'm assuming everyone, at least I know everyone here knows, but the public may not know because I don't even know what's been in the paper, but um, could the manager or, or town clerk advise what has gone on and why this is? I'm really not privy I to believe that, that um, Ms. Miles is no longer a resident of Scarborough okay. before it brought forth this special election. Yep. Yes. Uh, and a uh, question for the, for the clerk. I know there was some discussion around um, needing to set the date in 60 days versus having the election in 60 days was the, this seems like a very tight window. So I was just looking for the, what in, the. In conferring with the town attorney, he says that from the 60 days from the time the resignation was given, so we have to hold the election. Have to hold the, actually hold it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, one more oh, question. Sorry, yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, absentee balloting, is that going to be allowed? And if so, when? Once we set the ballot, it would be February 1st. Okay, thank you. So it's coming up fast. Correct. Right. So um, sum it all up, there is a seat open on the Board of Education. If you're interested, you should come to the town clerk's office and find out requirements as soon as possible. Correct? Any other comments? Questions? I yes. would just thank Kate for her service. Oh. Ashley? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> your, your service too, Councilor Sink. You know what I was I, I met, then? I met Kate Miles. And then I was like... Dr. Miles. Are you going yes. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to let everybody know tonight <laughs> that... No. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Six to zero. Oh, boy. Order number 17-010, discussion with action on the following. First, um, do I need to read the whole thing? This is... This is a discussion. This is not a uh, action. Summarize. Can you summarize it rather than me read that entire paragraph? That's a lot. Essentially, uh, Matt Sturgis, I'm pleased for Matt. Uh, Matt has been our contracted assessor for about uh, 18 months. Matt has just been newly appointed the town manager in Cape Elizabeth. Mm. Uh, very pleased for him and his professional development. Uh, bad news for us is we need to find a way to deal with our assessing needs. Mm -hmm. And so what this motion does, and there's two parts to it, it uh, appoints Susan Russo, who is our assistant or deputy assessor currently, and uh, Sue is actually filled in the, in the interim capacity in the past as well. She's a full certified main assessor, has all the proper credentials, so she would uh, fill in in the interim capacity until such time her replacement's uh, named, and that's an action this council will take. Uh, and the second piece is to appoint Matt Sturgis himself as a specially special deputy assessor for purposes of assisting the town in its defense of the existing tax, uh, ongoing tax appeals. Uh, the council heard some particulars on those this evening, so it's critical that we keep some consistency uh, in that regard. So um, with that, just for uh, kind of structural purposes, we should actually have a motion on one and two? Yeah. So correct, for action, correct? You could certainly divide, divide them if you wished. Uh, or as one. I suggested them be combined, but you can divide them if you like. So... Um, I could do... I could... No, um, I was going to... I tried to underline that I can actually... I'd, I'll make a motion t that the council appoint Susan Russo um, on an interim basis as assessor for the town of Scarborough effective January 30th, 2017. Um, Ms. Russo's appointment to go forward under her current terms of employment with the town and continue as such as the council appoints a successor and to appoint uh, Matthew Sturgis as a special deputy assessor effective January 30th, 2017 for the town of Scarborough for purposes of overseeing, attending to, and representing the town of Scarborough in ongoing tax abatement proceedings and authorization of reasonable consideration to be paid by Mr. Sturgis for his services to be set forth in a letter agreement from the town manager. And that was in a form of a motion. Second. Uh, discussion, comments? 
Councillor Sinclair. I would just, um, just for the record, um, you said consideration to be paid by Mr. Sturgis. It's consideration to be paid to Mr. Matthew oh, Sturgis. Just yes, for the record. Sorry. I'd love it if he paid it, but that's fine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Councillor Chiazza. So, um, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to, to Mr. Sturgis. That's a great move for him. Um, mm. Question to the town manager. Um, he was a shared position, I believe, with Cape Elizabeth, and in light of his position as the new town manager of Cape Elizabeth, would we, might we expect to see a similar arrangement potentially in the future? I certainly would like to explore that option to its fullest extent. That's, uh, that's one of the options I would like to consider. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the manager? Comments? Not seeing any. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Six Thank zero. You. And can I see their agenda? Oh, yes. I had to get her my note. Uh, the next is non-action items. I'm not seeing any. No, it's okay. Um, and item number nine is standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I'll start with Council Rowan. Oh, thank you. Um, so the senior program advisory board met. Um, there was a, um, they have a few openings on the committee. They discussed uh, trying to do some recruiting. Um, they were also um, have their vice chair position open um, and they um, had a member that was not present that they decided they couldn't <gasps> vote in without him being there. So they're hoping next time. Um, <laughs> there was a, uh, we were uh, joined by um, uh, Tom and well as um, uh, Joe Doss from the Maine Senior Games, and there was a lengthy discussion about the um, outdoor facility uh, placement potential uh, that was talked about, um, that was actually approved in, in the last budget. Um, so there's um, uh, a lot of excitement there, and it sounds um, like there are a lot of great ideas for what might be included. Um, they also um, had a lengthy discussion about um, um, increasing their visibility and kind of outreach to uh, other um, seniors, because they're doing some wonderful uh, programs and and have some regular meetings and and get-togethers and they want to um, you know they want to get the word out so that's it oh, I apologize uh, Councilor Foley uh, yes um, there's been some email correspondence with the rules and policies committee and um, given the direction of the council chair uh, and waiting for a couple of other committees to get some other pieces going, uh, we've postponed uh, and are now looking at dates in February, so I'll keep everyone apprised as to when those dates come to fruition. Uh, I attended the my second Eastern Trail Alliance meeting, and uh, just a great, great group of people doing some really great work in town. They wanted me to very specifically send a very big thank you um, to the town staff. Uh, specifically, they mentioned Dan Bacon, Tom Hall, and Bill Reichel. Um, for their ongoing support and engagement of the Close the Gap campaign. Um, and to the public, they want you to know that they're almost halfway to the goal of the matching funds. The good work still continues. Stay tuned for a very fun and exciting event in the spring. And uh, we hope to see you out enjoying the Eastern Trail. And I also attended my first Conservation Commission meeting. Um, another fantastic thank you for the committees you send me to. They're great people. We had a please um, do. <laughs> but um, so they, they caught me up to speed on one of the, their big projects, which has been um, a really concerted effort to look at uh, public safety and emergency management and how prepared we are as a town for any catastrophe that could hit us. Um, and they're going out very methodically with their questionnaire and meeting with the various departments and then have plans to report back um, as, as they get that information. Um, they also uh, had some discussion um, around Avenue 2, and they asked that I would read this statement. Um, so I need my glasses. <laughs> Uh, the Commission discussed some of the issues surrounding the Avenue 2 issue, a paper street between King Street and the ocean that serves as a walking path to the beach. The Commission, as a point of principle and consistent with the town's existing comprehensive plan, supports continued promotion of expanded public access to the ocean and supports continued public ownership of access points to the ocean. It is a cause of concern to the Commission that private control of access points, even with easements that would allow current public access to the ocean could be potentially abrogated at some point in the future. Is that how you pronounce that word? No, I pronounce it. All right. 
I'm not sure it's right. He says that's right. So that sounds good. So they just wanted to uh, kind of float that out there. They will, I think some of them will attend the workshop um, on February 1st. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Chiazzo. So um, I attended my first long range planning meeting, um, the result of which is in your packet, the recommendation, key points for recommendation from long range planning. I was very impressed with their. Um, their, a, their makeup, and B, their, their um, knowledge and, and, and fortitude in discussing these issues. It was, uh, uh, I don't know if they're quite as fun as shellfish, but they, are, they certainly are a, a very vibrant group, to say the least. So uh, very uh, much looking forward to continuing that process, especially as the comprehensive development plan starts to come into, into shape. Um, appointments is typically scheduled. We, we tried to, to, to set a general meeting time of a half an hour before each meeting. Uh, each regularly scheduled council meeting, we, um, uh, uh, Councilor Donovan is away. We had a very extensive schedule this week, uh, so we decided to forego our meeting this, this afternoon. But we certainly will be taking up um, some of the structural changes and some of the, some of the questions of, of, of um, purpose and intent of the, of the committee and that kind of stuff within the next meeting, probably, hopefully, uh, a half an hour before the, the next scheduled town council meeting. Councilor Hayes? Yeah, just a quick update. The <clears throat> Finance Committee meet, uh, met on January 12th and kind of we did several things. One, we re reviewed the financial statements. And in the past, we've handed them out, you know, printed copies. This, this time, we've distributed them electronically if they could, it saves trees and staff time. Let us know if that works for all of you. If it doesn't, we'll go back to printed. The other thing we're working on, as you do look at them and, you know, work with them, what we're trying to do is come up with a simpler format maybe or some change mm -hmm. to the format. If there's anything you'd like to see differently or would be helpful to you, just let us know. We're working on that. Um, we we kind of reviewed goals and norms, but we're also kind of waiting for us to do our work around that, which I think Sean will probably announce is toward the end of the, toward the end of the month. Um, and we had a great presentation of some of the work that we had started on the Finance Committee last year is try to figure out what are the right metrics that we want to use to kind of measure and be able to gauge where we are. And we had a great presentation by Larissa Crockett, sorry. Yes, perfect. And she did a great job. I mean, she put a lot of work into it. She came up with, with several, and it, they looked really good. We've asked her to come back with her recommendations for the ones that maybe are a good starting point for us. So we will, as we get closer to that, share that with all of you and share with you what we're thinking. Um, we talked a little bit about budget expectations, but again, it'll come out of sort of our planning session, but we're still sort of thinking about it's the adder around 3% that we've talked about in the past. That may change, but that's sort of where we are. Where we are. The first joint finance committee meeting between the Board of Education and the Town Council is tomorrow at 2 o'clock Thursday here. And the finance committee meeting will be the second Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. And I think that pretty much sums up stuff we did. Do you have a follow-up something? I, I did. I apologize. I'm also the liaison to GP COG, and I wanted to mention that we did have a regional meeting in, in Gorham that I attended with Councilor Donovan, um, Chairman Baybine, and, and, and Mr. Hall um, regarding... Mr. Rowan? And Councilor Rowan. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. We even sat next to each other, too, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, uh, basically looking at um, uh, inputs for goals and stuff for GP COG for the future, but a very interesting point that came out of that was... Um, uh, some potential work from the main Turnpike Authority, and I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but um, we're uh, certainly, hopefully, we'll see something in front of the council fairly soon with a, an update in terms of the project uh, that's potentially going into Gorham. Um, so I don't want to put any details out there because we're not really at that point, um, but it certainly was an in-depth discussion. I think it's something that will come in front of the council uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. So sorry, I forgot about that. Thank you. Regular report. Sinclair. Um, did you want to give your Did you want to give an update on the tour that you took last week? Oh with, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. As a report out from the Public Safety Committee, what we did do last week is we actually had some organized tours of recently built police and fire stations around. Basically, it was Brunswick cops and took a look at it. it was great. And, and what was really good about it, we actually had the folks in the building really sharing with us things they'd do again, things they wouldn't do again, and. It was great. I mean, they, they were very generous, very open. We had some, I think, great learnings about things to think about. So it was very productive and it was a good turnout. Most of the team was there. So look forward to that. I think the next step is we have put out some bids for proposals on consultants to help us kind of work through the process of what we need in design and location. 
Um, there's been a preliminary committee that's kind of weeded down some of it to a finalist list, and those will be interviewed. I think those now are scheduled at the end of the month. 30th. 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 And actually, we need to. Yeah. Um, so I actually didn't get to attend those tours, um, but I'm going on Friday with um, the chief and Kevin Freeman to York. Um, that's also a new station. Um, and what we're looking at is um, stations that are combined, so fire and police, because that's what ultimately our goal is. Um, also, um, communications, I'm chair of communications. We got a, we we're getting a rough start on that. I apologize. I've been sick um, the last, seems like the last three weeks. Um, but one thing I did do was put um, my own survey, speaking of surveys, out um, and talk to some people about trying to do um, like a monthly town hall type forum where there's one or two counselors that meet with whoever wants to come and instead of three minutes they get their complete access to us. Um, and we actually had quite a good um, response to that. Um, people seem to want that, um, and the thing that we talked about was there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be a three lim three minute limit, and we also talked about the fact that a lot of times we may not be able to give them direct or or answers, um, but we could always get answers. Um, but it would be like a listening session type thing, um, and so there seemed to be some interest there in that. But that's something that I'm still waiting to meet with the town manager on. Um, I have asked. Tom is going to meet with me. I've also asked for SEDCO to be involved in that. One thing that I feel very strongly about, and this is something the chair and I have talked about, is you know, anytime there's any kind of opening in Scarborough, anything that goes on in Scarborough, there always should be a council member at that. If the chair can't be there, the vice chair can't be there, there should be a council member there, um, especially with businesses that are opening. I just think it sets a precedent for the businesses to know that we care that they're here, and we're glad that, they're, we're, that we're here. And it also puts a face. If they're having an issue or a problem, our face is there. They get familiar with it, and they're going to be more apt to come and possibly talk to us about those issues. I know when I go into On the Vine, the owner there knows me so well, and he has no issue now saying, hey, uh, this happened, or I didn't like this about the process. And it's been a great, we've had a really great dialogue. So that's, that's where that stands. And I do have a wonderful committee um, for communications, and after I meet with Tom, and I believe um, Larissa Crockett is also going to be joining us. Um, Larissa and um, Karen Martin from SETCO, once we meet that first initial meeting, which I hope will be next week, um, my committee will get together and we'll start banging out some stuff. But it's a, it's a really exciting committee. I'm not sure Sean's that excited that he put the chattiest person as a chair of that committee, but, you know, it's cool. I'm okay with it. Um, but it is, it's really exciting to talk about. and. Um, to think about the possibilities that we have. Um, boy, that sounds really ditzy. But I'm just excited about it, to be honest with you, because I think we do have a lot of possibilities and a lot of really great things that we have access to now. And I think we're going to reach a point where there's going to be no reason for anybody to ever say, I, geez, I didn't know that was happening, because we have gonna, we're going to reach so many areas that there's going to be no reason for anybody in this town to say that they could not access information. Um, and then that's it, I think, for me. I think that's plenty. Um, the only one really to um, report on is schools, um, since I'm on all the other committees, but um, the library hasn't met. Just wanted to mention that um, in speaking with uh, Chairwoman Murphy, that um, they are continuing their work regarding the long-range facility planning that they've undertaken. Um, so uh, just to calm some comments that have happened, there has been no decisions that I know of about any type of proposal coming forward at this particular time, but they're looking at all solutions um, regarding not only um, the total services that they provide in the facility, but also the degradation of the three existing communities. So um, if you're interested, I believe that plan has been available online. I'll check to make sure. Um, but there is a plan that they are working, and it's a very thorough one. I believe all of us attended um, the presentation, maybe okay. close. Yeah. Sorry. So it's, it's a very thorough plan. So I just wanted to make sure everyone is aware that that plan is moving, still moving forward. Uh, so, um, outside of committee reports, uh, town managers, uh, reports. Yep. Just a few quick items. Um, I've been very busy doing performance evaluations that time of year. Um, I do it for all my senior staff and direct reports. Um, really become an important function for our staff, and we've improved some of our systems. So, uh, but it's still a lot of work, frankly, to do it and do it do it right. Um, 
so that, that is occupying some of my time and attention these days. Uh, we also have uh, two positions, two director positions that are open, community services. Uh, that position closed uh, on Sunday, and so we've uh, done my initial review of the applicants. I'm pleased to report I have 30 applicants, uh, three of which are internal, which is uh, terrific to see that we have folks that are interested and I, I think uh, perhaps capable uh, of taking over the next step. Uh, so I've assembled a staff-driven uh, process. I believe first interviews will be next week, and then we'll short, shorten that list down and uh, hopefully very quickly move to uh, finding a new community services director. And as was mentioned earlier, we're just beginning the process to understand how best to approach assessing needs. And uh, I have requested that Cumberland County provide us with a cost quotation for them to provide that service. Uh, this is something we looked at last time, and I think it's an important um, it's important to make sure we have all the options in front of us, frankly. Um, I have begun discussions and I'll continue them tomorrow with Matt Sturgis uh, in his new capacity to see how we may uh, share a service going forward. And of course we can always uh, consider the fact of hiring our own full-time assessor. That's always an option to us. Um, that decision incidentally is a, uh, is a decision, decision of council, so I'll be sure to uh, make the chair aware of, of the process I'm undertaking and certainly thank you advised as well. Uh, just two quick uh, things for your calendar. February 4th will be the fifth annual uh, rally to keep our neighbors warm. This is in conjunction with, or really led by Project Grace. It's right here at the Oak Hill Fire Station. It's from 10 a.m. to noon. And we have a fundraising goal of 15,000 in those two hours. Uh, local resident Eddie Wooden has, um, if we can get to 12.5, he'll finish us up. So he's offered up $2,500 if we can get to that. And uh, that seems like a, a large goal it is, but we've had some experience and we, we should be able to meet it. Uh, but it does require folks to get out. And lastly, just to make you aware, I'm scheduled to make my annual presentation to the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce on February 9th. Uh, at their normal monthly meeting. Uh, this year will be held at 7.30 in the morning at Main Carding, I think it's called, down in the um, industrial park. And I think this year might be uh, slightly different. Uh, in years past, I've, been, I've done kind of the state of Scarborough approach. They're looking for kind of a look backward and a look forward. So I need to sit down and start to think that presentation through, but um, I'll certainly share that with you once I have it done. Thank you. Um, just as a follow-up, if we could talk, because uh, I've been asked to do the same for Kiwanis in March. So uh, that mean you want to use my presentation? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair At least we need to be consistent. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Collins, I'm going to sit down at the uh, opposite end with Councilor Chiazzo. Um, so it's late. I'll keep it short. I just want to uh, commend the group for a very rigorous debate and discussion. I think it's healthy. I think it's positive, um, and I, uh, I certainly. Um, I think it's it's well serviced to the community and and even if we don't agree I think it's a great process and I want to thank all of you and commend you all for for tonight I thought it was good work. Councilor Hayes. No, I'm good. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor St. Kilhire. Um, I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Foley. I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Oh, well, I wasn't going to say anything, but now I feel. <laughs> 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 no, I got nothing. Thank you. Great. Uh, a couple items just uh, for follow-up. One is I did want to make a known because it will happen before our next meeting. We have scheduled a meeting of the town, um, a scheduled a workshop of the town council for January 30th. It will be from 5 to 7 p.m. at the library conference room. Um, I sent that out and didn't hear from anybody, so I'm hoping it's still valid. Um, and the purpose of that is to set goals or at least begin that process and dialogue. The first hour is intended to look back and assess um, last year's performance to make sure that we're all in agreement on our success um, and close out the year. And then second is to then um, uh, to begin a uh, conversation of looking forward. I'm sorry? I was asking, I didn't get that, so I was just asking if someone else had gotten it. Okay, the 30th. Yep. Okay. I'll resend the email, oh, but okay. um, My mistake. I believe it was a week ago. Um, the second half is to uh, begin conversation. It's more of a presentation. I will get the presentation out to you. Um, and that is that I've been able to uh, um, aggregate everyone's um, requests around um, um, goals for next year and kind of put it into somewhat of a working document. And so I at least want to uh, present that. I'll try to get it to you early. 
um, so that you can start thinking about how it's presented and we can have a conversation around that to set goals. We may need to set a second session, um, maybe shorter, to, so that we can finalize those goals and goal statements. Because a lot of what I've received are um, based on the format that we used last year, are metrics driven, they're more metrics rather than a goal statement, and so we can talk about more about that. So I'll, I'll make sure I get that to you. Um, I did want to mention, um, I believe I, I responded to a citizen's uh, comment regarding our financial statements and audit report. I want to make sure all the counselors, I'm, I've asked the town manager to include on the February 1st um, meeting as a non-action item and then we may actually suspend the rules and take it up early so that we can, because um, we'll, we'll have uh, school board members and staff here to take up um, the audit report and findings presentation. By charter, it is required that we take that up no later than the first meeting in February. So we talked about that in finance committee, but when we did the reference back to the charter, there's a the time restriction, so that will be presented, taken out of committee and brought back to the full council. Um, also wanted to mention that at that meeting in the beginning, I believe we're starting at 5.30 or 6. Up and set, but that's the workshop for Avenue 2. Right, yeah. so just wanted to mention that we will have a workshop. It will be regarding the uh, Avenue 2 um, question and, and uh, discussion around the, um, that land. Um, that's there and the, uh, what they call the paper street of that. I did want to just um, make um, the public aware that um, we w are taking an unusual step in the sense that we have invited a interest group um, or um, the, I think it's called the Pine Point Residents Association or something close to that, Homeowners Association or something like that, uh, to actually be a participant in that because they've, uh, we've had a community discussion with them so we've asked um, or we've invited two of their members to be able to sit at the table and ask questions because they have quite a few and thought that was useful. Uh, we will have public comment as well um, at the session. Um, generally, it will probably be at the end of the session though so that we can get through the work in the workshop. Um, wanted also, um, um, I believe I've scheduled it just about everybody. I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to do my best in communicating with all of you on a regular basis. I've set up our regular coffees, one-on-ones, uh, -on and then also two in pre-calling. So if there's anything I can do for anybody, uh, please feel free that the phone goes both ways, except for when you're driving in Lebanon, Maine, and it goes out of service when you're talking to the vice chair. Um, wanted to mention, and um, I, I, I'm almost positive it's public, um, wanted to congratulate Nancy Crowell. Nancy has been selected as the um, Scarborough's Great Person of the Year. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't know Nancy, um, I would be surprised because Nancy has been involved with Scarborough for, um, and I, I apologize uh, to the, to the uh, young lady, but I believe for almost 40 years mm -hmm. in one capacity or another, mostly as our library director, but she's been involved in many committees, many groups, um, and she's also very active in her own community. She used to be a big presence in the historical society in South Portland. So I just wanted to congratulate her because she does an incredible job for the community that she's adopted over the years. And um, so I did want to, um, and so I, I apologize for being lengthy, but I had to write out some comments because I've been asked by counselors as well as others to um, emphasize some um, issues around executive sessions. So I'm going to read very quickly um, some comments around that because I think it's important based on comments that have been made. Um, recently we've received comments from citizens and um, have noticed that there's been some ancillary verbal and nonverbal gestures by some councils with respect to executive sessions. We've heard and seen over the microphone and on tape at our last meeting that has drawn some to question um, what are executive sessions. The purpose of the executive session is in governmental bodies is not to hide the important information from the public, but to rather to protect everyone that is involved. This is as a result of particularly um, citizen comments that are suggesting that there's somehow some sinister activity happening behind closed doors. Um, and I think it's very important that it, it's, it's about protecting everyone involved. Comments and gestures suggesting something more sinister is happening is not accurate, especially from any counselor who participates in the executive session and does not express their opinion to the contrary. In this case, the information surrounding ongoing litigation on tax assessments was discussed um, tonight. Executive sessions of the town council are provided by statute so that the town can address issues involving privileged information and matters of a private nature. The council may go into executive sessions for the following matters, and this is just a general list. Legal issues, um, board, uh, councils can go into executive sessions to consider litigation and issues related to strategic, strategic direction for future litigation, formation of contracts, 
um, as they relate to third parties, um, such as Avenue 2. Um, and personnel issues, personnel matters, which include but are not limited to the hiring, firing, raises, disciplinary matters, and performance review, as we've taken up in the past regarding our own employee. Um, recently, um, as I mentioned, we've held um, those executive sessions um, around the town manager's performance review, legal issues relating to the formation of a contract, and legal issues around the tax assessments uh, to, and the abatements or the um, Board of Assessment Review. As we all know, personal matters are confidential. Uh, one issue that has been uh, sent to us, and we were criticized for not commenting, but I did issue a pu public um, notice. Um, I did send it to each of you uh, on behalf of the council as a whole, but also issued it, I believe, it to um, the press as well because of a citizen inquiry, and that is regarding Mr. Hall's performance. Um, in summary, I'm not going to read that um, particular notice, but um, you know, it's very pleasing that the council is obviously very satisfied with Mr. Hall. He is meeting and exceeding all of his objectives. Um, from an executive session perspective, think about how harmful that would be to Mr. Hall and even somewhat harmful to the council and to the town if we had to discuss a different scenario in public and it's not fair to him as an employee or us because um, that is a matter of confidentiality. Um, so I hope people understand that we do use them diligently um, when they're necessary and we do limit our conversation to the legal issues or the issues that are required to be private. So I hope that the citizens have um, trust in us um, when we do have to use that. Um, and last, I wanted to mention regarding tonight and the permits. Um, I want to thank everybody that's commented, that's been part of this. It's very, very important to hear from people. Um, I am very, uh, you know, I'm pleased about the outcome. Um, I don't see this necessarily being a divider, um, dividing issue within our community. What I do want to mention, and so and it kind of ties into why I might have had a frown about the communications, uh, some things, is that um, I think we need to be careful because some of the comments that I received, um, some people just aren't polite. They're rude. Um, I got a very crude call from one citizen, um, and they have no filter. It's like dealing with a child. And so putting us in a situation where it's an open format, I think, can have its dangers. I'm not necessarily adverse to it. but when you don't have certain protocols in place in which people have to act like adults, um, we have to be careful. And so I just hope that whatever recommendations come forward that we take into consideration because there's just some people out there that can't filter themselves. And I, I want to be careful of it. But 99.9% .9 of the time, everyone is, their information is great. Um, and everybody's opinion matters to me and I did take it into consideration. So I appreciate that. If there's no other work or no other comments, um, motion to adjourn? Moved. Second. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you, everybody.